Hello, Taylor. Hello, how are you? Oh, I'm so good. And I'm thrilled that we get to speak as we've been sort of Instagram pen pals and now exactly. we're actually meeting. I know. Well, it's funny that this is really actual meeting today, you know, that, I know. Uh, you I know, know this is uh, as good as it gets. Seeing someone's face. Exactly. I know. I haven't done a Zoom one in a while, but you're you're in Los Angeles at home, yes. right? Yes. I know you're right. coming to the UK very soon, but it just mm-hmm. happened to be the week my kids are off school, which is carnage. No. So I'm no. I'm gutted. I'm not going to see you in the flesh. I know, I know. But you know what? Like when your kids are off school, that takes press. I can't, I can't do anything, anything when my no. kid's home. <laughs> No, 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 you really, really can't. It's impossible. You have grand plans and they just all go out the window within half an hour of them waking up. It's it's oh. almost impossible. <clears throat> and I also find that uh, I'm happier if I just give into it. Like, yeah. just just give into it. This is what I'm doing. I can't get anything else. Surrender. Done. Surrender. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Because otherwise you're just going to, you, you never quite hit the bar. It's, it's There's no point having plans. Um, so you're in Los Angeles. It's the morning time yeah. for you. Early yes. evening for me. It's, I mean, I'm not going to tell you anything you're not expecting. It's grey outside and a bit windy <laughs> and a bit of shit. <laughs> How's LA? Can I tell you, I'm actually really jealous to hear that because it's what? very, very hot here. It's so hot. I'm so sick of it. Like, this is this is the thing that I feel like when you talk to people in Los Angeles and in September and October, um, the feeling is just like, we're done with summer and summer is not done with us. And it is so, it's, it's, um, it's 90 degrees here today. I only know Fahrenheit. I'm so sorry. No, we can um, convert. It's fine. Thank you. That's I, the fact that other people have to convert that I don't know how <laughs> is really um, inexcusable. Um, and it's just sweltering hot. So I I think of, um, you know, a gray day and I get very, I romanticize it. No, there's nothing romantic about it. Let me tell you, Taylor, before we we logged on to Zoom here. I went for a quick walk because I've been doing some voiceovers. It was freezing. It was windy. I tried in some fox shit, which I hadn't realised until about <laughs> 10 minutes later. And I was like, why do I stink? What is going on? It's grim. Wait, <sighs> you walked in fox shit? It wasn't dog shit. Fox. It's a very distinct smell. Completely different to dog shit. It's quite tart. I don't even know what... That would be like to horrific walk in fox shit. That's not a thing that happens here. <laughs> oh no, there's foxes everywhere in everywhere, rural or urban areas. We've got urban foxes. They are bloody everywhere. And fox shit is such a distinct a distinct smell. It's really tart and a bit sort of sweet in a horrible way. Ugh, oh, it's rank. Oh, I don't know what to this do with is the terrible. Shoes. This is terrible. I, I take it all back. I'm not jealous of anything now. <laughs> I You're going to have to get that used that to this. Possible. It's so possible. <laughs> I've left my trainers on the step hoping that it just sort of disintegrates oh, naturally. Yeah, maybe it just, just evaporates <laughs> away. It's, it won't. It's a big clump. Anyway, <laughs> Taylor, I can't, I can't waste your time talking about fox shit. For God's sake. <laughs> so many things to talk to you about. First of all, a heartfelt thank you from me um, because you've given me so much, well, and millions of other people, so much escapism with your oh, beautiful you. books, hours and hours where I've been able to dive into a completely different world. And, you know, your novels are so popular and stand out because you offer that all encompassing experience. If you're not just reading a story, like you're in it, you're there. And it's just the most gorgeous feeling. And this is the most obvious question, but I, I just don't understand. Like, where the hell do these stories come from? Where do they come from? <laughs> um, well, thank you for saying all that, first of all. That really means a lot to me. And um, I I really want to escape into these stories and lose myself in these stories. And so the fact that other people can makes me really happy. So thank you. Um, I really am just following my own interests. I'm just going, oh, that seems interesting. Oh, I don't know anything about tennis. That could be fun to learn about. Um, I find that I'm really privileged to have a job that allows me to learn about things I don't know about. And so I just think of something I don't know anything about and then throw myself in head first. And it is really, really fun. Oh, it is the best fun. And you certainly take us with you because 
I get lost in your books. And I think it's also, again, quite rare with the novels that you feel that emotion on a very visceral level. You know, I cried at Carrie Soto. I cried in Daisy Jones. And that, at the end of Daisy Jones, I was like in floods. That is so <laughs> rare that that happens. So you've obviously got this incredible innate skill where you're able to translate emotion into these stories and get everybody to to feel it. It's it's just remarkable. And obviously you've now created this whole universe because with four of your books, the characters cross pollinate and they, they all kind of pop up in different books. Do you feel mm -hmm. like your characters are out there somewhere living and breathing because you've given them so much time? I really do. I'm embarrassed to say this, but you know, people will ask, you know, when you finish a book, do you miss your characters and I always go no why would I miss them they're here like they they live in my mind I get to know them so well and I I understand that they're not real people I do understand that but it doesn't feel that way to me in my head and so um you know I think about somebody like Evelyn Hugo and it's no, I don't miss her. She's she's with me all the time. She's I, I hear her voice and I hear her saying things and I hear what she would think about things. And uh, I feel that way about Carrie Soto, too, that, you know, I spent, you know, certainly a year, really more like two years writing her, getting to know her, trying to understand her. And like, you come to understand her in such a way where she'll never leave me. And uh, that's really very fun to to know that at any given time I could ask a question and access whatever part of my brain you know Carrie lives in um to find what she would think about it it's amazing and with those four books that I've just already mentioned you each character or certainly there's a focus with the main characters um they they're famous they're renowned humans what what interests you about fame? What's drawn you to that subject matter to poke around in it and explore it? Yeah, there's a few different reasons. One of them is that fame is a really great way of writing about societal expectation. Because when it comes to the people that we allow to be famous, the people that we give our attention to, we tend to do that in response to whether they support or challenge the status quo. So uh, we are particularly intrigued by people who both uphold it and challenge it at the same time. And that allows me to talk about the way that our expectations of how people should behave controls our behavior. Carrie Soto is a person who isn't bending to societal expectation. And I want to see how the world treats a woman like that. And I want to see how the world treats a woman like Nina Riva, who does bend to societal pressure, but ultimately it is eating her away inside. And I want to see how we treat a woman like Daisy Jones, who understands that the world is not inclined to respect her, but is not able to accept that and keeps trying and trying and trying. I want to look at how a woman like Evelyn Hugo is a number of things that the world tries to control. She doesn't, she is an outsider, but she understands that in order to work within the system, she has to appear like an insider on many different levels. So fame allows me to talk about the way that we try to restrict women's behavior and how those women bump up against those restrictions. But the other thing that is interesting about fame is that it's really just talking about a heightened version of many women's lives. Carrie Soto is the number one WTA player in the world at one point. So we're we're talking about this story of what it is to be a female athlete at the highest level. That's what's fun about Carrie Soto. But hasn't or haven't most women been worried that if they're too confident in how they appear, that the world isn't going to embrace that and they will face a consequence for it? So I can talk about things that affect everyday women 
but I can do it at this heightened high concept level. So it's really fun and it's glamorous, but it's also about what it's like to be a woman today. And that combination of meaningful, but also fun and escapist is really, really important to me. I want to give people a good time. I want to dazzle you. I want to transport you. I want to give you a vacation from your life. While you're on vacation, are there some things I want to talk to you about? Some things I want to let you know I support you? Uh, if you feel this way, I feel it too. Yes. But I just life is hard and everybody needs a break. Yeah. And that's, like I said at the start of this chat, you off, you totally offered that. Like I would happily each night when I was reading Carrie Soto over the summer escape into that amazing high-end sporting world and the drama and the romance and all of it and it was just like oh, like a relief that I could step out of like not that like my life is awful I you know I'm very happy but just to go right okay the kids are in bed that was bloody hard work now I get to just dive into this absolutely brilliant world and I think it's so fascinating looking at specifically women in the context of fame because there does still disproportionately seem to be this difference with how men and women are treated in the public eye and how you know and that's that's not just sort of the male observer spectator commenting it's all of us commenting on women and, and how we even on a subconscious level will be judging and casting opinion and it's it's kind of crazy that the world still works like that, but that's very much where we're at. Like nothing much, like everything's changed, but nothing much has changed in terms of females in the public eye over the last hundred years. It's um, it's mad. Yeah, and you're right that women do it to women too. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and I think that's part of what is important to me to talk about is um, you know, there there are parts of Carrie Soto where you hear from the media. You hear whether it's a transcript of a, um, like a, a bunch of sportscasters, or you hear, you see like an, an editorial letter or just, you know, you hear from the media about what they're saying about Carrie Soto. And I had somebody ask me a question where they said, well, why are all of the, why is all the media um, men? And I was like, it's not. You have go back and, and read the book. There are women in here who make it seem like they support Carrie Soto, who are saying at first the right things, but then eventually come back to the same conclusion to uphold the status quo. And that and and I felt very much like when I was writing the book, I wanted to make it clear. Yeah, men can be terrible to women. Men are judgmental of women. Men want to keep women in a specific box, but women do it too. Sometimes, oftentimes, the call is coming from inside the house. And we as women, I think it's really important that we look at the ways that we've absorbed these messages and we don't just um, shame or try to control our own behavior, but also unintentionally or intentionally try to then control other women's behavior too. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I, I love the example of Carrie Soto because of course she was, you know, throughout her tennis career, this character that wasn't up for sort of um, being overly chatty, conversational to other tennis players, but also to the press. She wasn't mm -hmm. going to kind of put frills around what she wanted to say. She was there to do the job and to be the mm -hmm. absolute best and to be focused. And it wasn't all about waving to the crowd and smiling and being this sort of, you know, showbiz tennis player. She was there to 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 play the game. And the mm -hmm. critique was very harsh because of that. But you could absolutely put a man in the same position who's just there to do the sport and be focused. And he would be commended for being so focused and so tunnel vision oh, with what he wanted to do. Absolutely. I think that in general... And unfortunately, I think in our culture, we're moving toward a place where we're starting to expect this of men too, which I think we're moving in the wrong direction. But it's you can't just be good at something, right? You can't just be a great tennis player, be a great artist, be a great 
you know, you have to be able to sell yourself. You have to be charming. You have to be likable, you know, that it's, we have a cult of personality. So you can't just be good at the thing and let us just respect that. We, we ask now that you sell us the entirety of you. And we've been doing that to women for a really long time. Women's appeal is not just their artistry, it is also their beauty. I mean, you look at how many singers, it's not, if you wanna be a singer, it's not just that you have to have a great voice, it's also that you have to be beautiful, fashionable, have a distinct point of view. Um, just that alone, think of all of the incredible, incredible artists that we aren't hearing or seeing because they don't fit into a particular ideal of what a woman is supposed to look like. That drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. And I look at somebody like Carrie Soto and what's fun about her is she doesn't want to count out a public opinion, but even if she did, she doesn't know how. She doesn't have that skill. She's not charming. And if she tried to be, it would read to you as false because that's a skill, that is a talent that people have to learn. And she never learned it. And, and she is in opposition to some of my other characters like Evelyn Hugo, who's so charming, who knows how to turn it on, who knows that in order to succeed in this world, she has to be beautiful and appear likable and have a, a star image that is complicated and leaves you aching for more. You know, what I like about Evelyn is she's so in control of everything about herself which I am really not. And Carrie is not, you know, um, and Daisy is not, uh, Daisy can't help, but be herself. There's not Daisy just is the things that Carrie could never be. Um, and so it's interesting, all of these different women and to see the, the different ways that they react to not only the societal structures, but also the camera and what it means for them. Carrie has never loved the camera, has never seen that that's where her power lies. Her power lies on the court. She's going to win the match. That's what Carrie's here to do. And what have your characters uh, and this exploration taught you about fame? Because I think fame is still like one of the biggest modern day myths. You know, it's not, <laughs> there is still this sort of general consensus that it will fix all your problems. It will boost your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. You'll feel heard and seen and complete and everything mm -hmm. must be rosy. I know that's a, a big generalization, but I do think that no. myth still holds up. And I wonder what you've learned about it and if your perception of fame has changed from writing these characters and, and these stories. I think my perception has changed. I, I think in that it has become more nuanced. I, I now have the words to express what was only a feeling before. Um, for me, certainly in my life and in looking at my characters, I can't foresee a happy ending in which your happiness is pinned on fame. I, I can't see, I can see a happy ending in which you make peace with fame. I can't see a victory in wanting it, getting it, loving it, wanting more of it. Um, and I think a big piece of that is that we really, really underestimate the importance of anonymity in our lives. That nobody is, nobody makes sense. Everyone's really complicated. People aren't the same person every single day. Sometimes you're really nice to the cashier and sometimes you're kind of brusque with the cashier. Sometimes you're really kind to the person you meet on the street and another time you're not your best self. There's no consistency in who a person is. That freedom to be inconsistent and to not be defined by the worst thing you said today or the worst thing you did today um, that's something that incredibly famous people give up 
they they are defined by every single moment of their life and nothing is ephemeral anymore especially today when everybody's taking a photo of you yeah. and everybody's you know texting uh you know sending a message to Dumois saying oh I saw this person at so and so and it's like they're just trying to get a coffee you know mm-hmm. um but I think that um I think fame is something people can learn to live with and make work for them. I don't see how it is an a good positive thing in a person's life. Yeah. Um I think it can be really really easy to lose touch with who you are on the inside because people's opinion and attention can get really really confusing. And I like writing about fame because, well, for a number of reasons, but one of the things is we we judge people who want to be famous. I, I think one of the things that we do that is like the most cutting thing that we can say is, oh, she just wants to be famous. Oh, she's yeah, just trying to get so famous, yeah. right? And I think it's really interesting because for a lot of, especially young women, not only young women, but especially young women, we don't really tell young women, oh, you could cure cancer or, or by the way, like the, the latest scientific discovery that helped millions of people. Do I know the name of the person who did that? Nope. Never heard of them. So we're not celebrating that person. So for young women, if you want to matter, if you want to be celebrated, what can you do? You can go be an actress. You can be an influencer. You can be a singer. You should be beautiful in order to do all those things. We may say you can grow up to be a doctor, but we don't celebrate the doctors. We don't celebrate teachers. We celebrate actresses. We celebrate, um, you know, these traditionally famous people. And then we wonder why young girls want to be famous. When I hear a young girl or a young person say they want to be famous, what I hear is I want to matter. Yeah. I want to matter. And this is how I've been told I will matter. And I just think it's really weird that we do, because of course we do, this is how society works, but we're going to tell you the only people that matter are these people. And then when you say you want to become one, we are going to side eye you and judge you for it because no, 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 messed up. It's so messed up. And, and we're saying, we're saying, no, no, no. I want you to sing because you enjoy singing because you're an artist and this is your craft and you're indifferent to whether or not you become famous. And it's like, good Lord, we are asking so much. Mm. I Mm. mean, it's just really silly. You've told a generation of people, these are the people that matter. These are the people that have their dreams come true. These are the people that make money and don't have to worry about when, how they're going to pay their rent. So yeah, that's why young people grow up wanting to become yeah. that. I think it's so interesting what you what you said a moment ago about, you know, we, we hold people in this high esteem or we, or we, you know, say, okay, this person's famous because... We know we can celebrate them, but equally, we're kind of okay if we're just slagging them off too. Whereas, you know, with we a doctor, love to do that. We love to do that. So mm-hmm. it almost has to be both. We're willing to love you, but we're also willing to absolutely cut you down if you make a single move wrong. Whereas if it is someone who's cured cancer or done something absolutely incredible, it's more like I absolutely respect you and there's no way I'm going to, you know, chip away at your self-esteem or what you've created because it's it's brilliant so it's it's so strange that we still equate fame with feeling heard and and mattering because Mm -hmm. that's actually not really what it is it's just sort of a willingness to go I'm going to point out what's good and bad about you well but that's kind of what's interesting is that at first I mean there's a there's you can sort of set your your clock by it when somebody first comes up and everybody's like, oh, look at this new person mm. and look at how fun they are. And, and, oh, she's so beautiful and she's so talented. And then, and then wait a minute, now she's too popular. So now the cool thing is to hate her. Yeah. And so you start with a few people and then, oh, wait, she's imperfect. She made a mistake. 
and now it's okay and I'm right and self-righteous to dislike her. It has it has a real curve to it. Mm, horrible little but, arc. Yeah, and and it it is not a, a cycle that I personally want to be caught up in. I find it sort of terrifying. But if you look at it and you only pay attention to the parts to the women that we're celebrating at this very moment in our culture, it looks really appealing. Mm. And and when we talk about, you know, we can be incredibly, we want to root for people up until the point where we feel like they have more than we wanted to give them. Yeah. And then we want to tear them down. Mm. When you talk about um, not doing that to, you know, a doctor or someone who's cured cancer, I think it's because we don't actually, we aren't given that much of them to consume. We don't know who's that doctor dating. Did did that doctor uh, have an affair at work? Did that doctor um, speak one way to a patient? We don't know. We have no idea. We're not given. I think we would do this with anybody if because we have the access. If it feels like it's up to us, yeah, we yeah. love to build people up. But once it feels like it's gotten away from us. We love to then tear them down. We want we're, to be in yeah. control. We're a bunch of psychotic control freaks, Taylor. Is what we, are. <laughs> we are. And how we do you are. feel about it now that your work is famous, your work is renowned? People will pull you up in the street and say, oh, my God, I love what you do. How does that feel, having had this extended period of digging around in that subject matter? Does it sit comfortably? No, it sits very uncomfortably. And I, and I think for a minute my reaction was to go, oh, well, that's not happening. That's just not happening. I didn't want it to happen. And saying that it was happening tell, felt self-aggrandizing. It felt like, who do I think I am? Like anyone cares who I am. And I just pushed it away for as long as possible. But at some point, it's just silly to deny what is plainly in front of me. I, there are times when I'm walking down the street and someone recognizes me. Um, I will be on an airplane and the and the flight attendant will come up to me and say, oh, are you Taylor Jenkins Reid, the author? And I loved your last book. And um, those moments are uh, really tricky for me. The, the, the individual moment itself is fine. It's always lovely to meet someone and, and that's fine. But um, I don't want to be famous. I don't want people to be interested in me. I'm that's very much a question I'm asking myself now is how do I give what I want to give, which is to say, I really enjoy writing and I love to tell these stories and I want to share these stories with people. How do I do that while putting the focus on my work and not myself? And, and I don't have the answers for that yet because we live in a time where that's not really what people want from you. Mm -hmm. And I, and I say it, you know, as a consumer myself, I, if I love a movie, if I love a book, I go look up, you know, who made it. I look up the artist as well as the art. So, um, you know, I, I totally understand it. I just, for me, I'm asking myself a lot of questions right now. But does it encroach on your work? Because of course, um, naturally what happens with being a renowned artist in whatever field is that the more renowned you become, the more noise there is, uh, good and mm -hmm. bad. So you'll get wonderful applause, but also there's always going to be someone that's going to critique your work. Can you still mm -hmm. write without inhibition? Or or are you now sort of second guessing, well, what do people want? How will they feel about this character? Will I be attacked if I'm writing about this subject matter? Can you still write as freely? You know, up until now, the answer has been yes. Yeah. Because I have, I've always had a, an ability to compartmentalize that, um, that has served me well sometimes, but other times I look at it and I'm like, how was I able to like completely separate these things when they're not separate at all? Uh, so up until now, yeah, I've felt really good about my time, just me in the page, that it, that it feels very pure. I know what I want to write and I... I'm aware of what um, people say about my work 
and when people say things that are critical and I agree with it, I try to learn. Um, but I don't know, as I, as I begin the process of, I'm going to start writing another book in the next couple of months. And, you know, I've, I'm always changing. My process is always changing. And I hope I can continue to have that purity between me and the page, but also it is important to listen to, um, critical things that people say that I think have merit. And so I'm, I'm trying to find that balance. And so, I mean, you're in this period now where you're going to start writing a new book with all of these books behind you, they're still mm -hmm. very much living and breathing, but you've done them and they're all massively loved and massively talked about. How do you deal with expectation from others and yourself as to how, where you go next, how you create another massive book, if you even want to create another massive book? Well, see, that's a really interesting question because I think the assumption is, oh, I just want to keep selling more and more books. I want to do something bigger than I've done before. And I think for me, part of this process of waiting to write another book was coming into the idea of, I have absolutely no intention of making any kind of sales record with my next book that is bigger than anything I've done. I, I want to get off that hamster wheel. I want to be writing books for a long time. I want to write books that matter to me, that feel honest and creatively challenging. And when it stops feeling good, I want to feel free to stop doing it. And so in order to save my soul from some of those temptations that can be really, I think, damaging, which is to say, I got to hit higher on the list than on the last one. I got to sell more copies than the last one. I need better media coverage than the last one. Like, I am turning all of that off. I am not interested. The only thing I am interested in is besting myself creatively. I yeah. want to write a better book than any book I've written before. I am not going to get on this this hamster wheel of book sales. I just can't do it. I don't want to have like, you know, an ache in my gut about something that to I, I don't want to call success silly because it's not silly. It's given me financial freedom, but I just don't want to measure myself by that stuff. I really yeah. don't. I could see my life going down a particular path that is just not fun. And it kills so, creativity. I think it just it does totally kills it. Like I, I even with this podcast, I, I, I can't concentrate on where each episode or the series is charting each week because I just want to feel like I've had a really good conversation and, you know, that's all you can really do. So I wonder, you know, say we're looking at like the, you know, I'm not going to spoil it for people that haven't read it, but in Carrie Soto, she's obviously dealing with looking at success and what that means to her and looking at, again, that difference between, I feel like I'm doing my best, but also, I mean, in sport, I guess it's slightly different because you win or lose a match, but there's also yeah. Yeah. the reception to that and how people say, oh, you are still, you know, an icon in tennis or for you, you are still the most, you know, loved and respected author. What, what does feel like, you know, the best creatively for you? Can you quantify it in your own world without book sales? What does that feel like? Yeah, I know... I, it's so funny because I have like definitive answers to that question. And for me, it's, have I challenged myself to write better sentences and, and more subtle uh, characterization than ever before? That's, that's a place just for me personally, I'm looking to get better. Um, that's where my pride is going to come from. That, that internal validation of here is my goal. Here's what I did to achieve it. I'm looking at the final product and do I believe I achieved it or not that, you know, I'm not going to let anybody else's opinion interfere with. That's the one piece. But the other piece is that I started writing stories because I wanted to give people an escape and a sense that they were not alone on whatever particular issue it was. So my job 
is not to get my next book into as many hands as possible. My job is to, to get my next book into the hands of people who might need it or benefit from it. That's my job. And I think that's the shift that I'm trying to make in the way I think about things. I will have been a success with my next book, not if I sold more copies than any other, not if I sell it as some big adaptation that gets a headline. And none of those things matter. What matters is if you can benefit from what I'm talking about here, if this can make you feel good, if it can give you a wild ride on a weekend at that moment where you just really needed a break, that's my job. My job is to try to get it to you when you need it. And that just feels so much more life affirming and, and lovely and from such a um, more open hearted place. Yeah, that's, your, that's purpose, from. isn't it? That's true purpose. Yeah. Rather than just like, yeah. I just want this to be amazing and be huge. Yeah. It's like, this is my purpose. <laughs> but like, we can't not talk about these adaptations because you've got some adaptations going on. Famously, obviously, Daisy Jones and the Six has been snapped up by Hello Sunshine, Reese Witherspoon's production company, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, obviously been talked about a lot and, and extremely exciting. First of all, I'll ask the question that I just want to know was that must have been the most exciting thing. How did that feel when you got that phone call? It was absolutely positively crazy and 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 very much a before and after in my life of, um, you know, there was before I got the email and after I got the email. Uh, was that... it an email from actual <laughs> Reese Witherspoon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. It was, it was, yeah. And, um, and of course, she's just the classiest, coolest lady. Of course lady, she is. I'm obsessed you know? with her. She's, she's, I mean, what I love about Reese is that she reads these books. Yeah. You ask Reese about any of her book club books. You ask her about any of the books that they're adapting. You can tell. Reese will be able to, oh, like there's a purity to it and a sincerity to it that I just, I just have so much respect for, for you know, what she's done has grown so big that if it was like, oh, she, you know, she doesn't read the books. I'd be like, I get it. You know, I get it. But that's just not how she runs her no. business. And I just love that. Um, yeah, it was, it was completely thrilling. But the other piece that was really thrilling that was an element of this from the beginning was that Scott Newsetter and Michael Weber were going to adapt it. And I am just such a massive fan of theirs. I could not believe that screenwriters who I had admired for such a long time were going to take over this project and I just I know look there there have been other adaptations and you have moments where you go oh, I don't know I don't know you know are they gonna ruin it I don't know I don't know uh, and I just never worried and and there was no need to worry because it is absolutely fantastic it's is truly, it done now is it wrapped it's done Oh. It's done. They they wrapped in the summer. Can't it's wait. absolutely fantastic. It I'm is dying. so like I, good. I can't even. When that comes on, I, my husband needs to take the kids out of the house. I need silence. <laughs> the cat will be locked in the garden. I need to just sit. Not even snacks. I just want to imbibe <laughs> every millisecond. Like, I can't wait. I have, like, visualised this whole book, and it, I just cannot wait. But then how do you feel? I know you were saying there, you know, obviously – you're a huge fan of their work. You can't wait for this, for their for their vision to to transpire. Is there an element of like I have to let go of this because you know it's you've you've written the book. You you see it and know what it means to you. But they're going to have a different version of that. Yeah, and and they should have a different version. And their version is slightly different than mine. But I think that's part of where I would normally be nervous, but in this instance was not was because the many, many conversations that I've had with Scott is one of the, uh, not the only time, but one of a few times where I could tell that what I loved about a story was exactly what Scott loved about the story. And he understood what the story stands for. And that's really my thing is the details can change and, and they have to. Um, you can make things a little bit more complicated. You can make things a little bit more simple. You can draw it out. You can, th that's important. You have to have the freedom to do that. Does the story still stand for the same thing? Does it still give you the same feeling? And they have done that. 
I mean, hallelujah. Yeah, oh. I just and Daisy Riley Keough is Daisy Jones. She is Daisy Jones. When I think about writing the book, I hear Riley's voice in my head now. I hear, wow. I see Riley. It is crazy to me that I didn't know when writing that book that she was so obviously Riley Keough. And I'm floored to be able to tell you because I thought this was in some ways going to be harder. Sam Claflin is Billy. Uh, is Billy. There is no Billy that is not Sam Claflin. So um, I just feel really like very, very blessed to be able to say that it's going to be absolutely fantastic. And I don't have to pretend or, you know, there's no faint praise. It's like, no, it's great. The cast is great. The writing is so great. The music is great. You've literally made my week. <laughs> I'm so happy about this. I just can't wait. And I obviously, I just love Daisy Jones because I'm personally obsessed with 70s rock music. That is my mm -hmm. absolute go-to musically yeah. always on any given day with any mood in mind. It, there's always something that I can find from that decade in rock music. And just to watch that era play out, it just seems like, I know all eras when you look back retrospectively, have that rose tinted quality. I, you know, I can do that certainly about my own teens in the nineties and, oh, it was a better mm -hmm. time, but it felt like in the seventies, it was, it was so free <laughs> and magical <laughs> and decadent. And it's just not like that anymore. It's not like that in my life anyway, but I can't wait. I can't wait to watch it. So I really want to talk to you about, for, for people out there who have got a deep passion for creativity. It doesn't have to be writing, but something creative. You know, when you're at school and you and you feel like creativity floats your boat, there aren't that many options for you going forward at that point. You go and see over mm -hmm. in the UK, you see a careers advisor and they go, oh, I don't know about that. Try being a whatever. And they give you a much more boring option. And you go, but that's not what I want to do. Did you mm -hmm. always have this sense that you... You needed this creative flow. Did you know that it was writing novels? And how did you not lose hope with that? Because I know that you've had other jobs before you, yeah. had, before you got yeah. a, a publishing deal. So how did you just talk me through that whole process? Yeah. You know, I always knew that I wanted to work in Hollywood. That was what I knew. I didn't know anything else. Um, and... So I went to film school. I moved to Los Angeles when I graduated. I got a job in casting, which was what I thought I wanted to do at the time. Um, I actually really loved that job. It was super fun to get to meet actors and work with them and, and help them. I mean, I was much more an administrative person because I hadn't worked my way up yet, but the creativity involved in that actually was really satisfying, very cool. And I think casting directors uh, don't get enough credit for just... Um, they are artists and I, I really admire it. Uh, but when I got to Hollywood and I started to see the different departments and how things worked, I was like, ah, this doesn't feel right. There's not a job in here that is exactly what I'm looking to do. And I started writing uh, not fiction. I just started writing like small little things, things that had happened to me today. You know, I'd moved far away from home. My friends were all back in Massachusetts. So I would just write to them, oh, this is what happened to me today. How are you? But like my emails would get longer and longer and they'd be, <laughs> they, they'd really be about- They're like, like oh, not another know. email from Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How much time am I going to have to sit here and read this thing? Um, and I would just write stories. I would write stories of things that happened to me. And my friends were really encouraging. I actually- wrote a story about something that had happened to me. I sent it to a couple of friends. One of them was a friend here in LA who whose husband was repped at William Morris at the time. And I remember she sent me an email and was like, I sent this to my husband. And he said, he thinks you're such a good writer that if you write a script, he will show it to his agent, which is like, you know, in Hollywood, that's, I mean, Huge. that's the holy grail. I've got it in my hand now, right? I mean, that's why you you network or whatever. So that encouragement really helped me. And I, but I was like, I don't want to write a script. It just doesn't feel like what I want to write right now. So I wrote what felt natural to me, which was a book. And 
absolutely fell in love. And I will say that I do think sometimes when you're growing up, you have this feeling of, I want to do something. I want to do something. I want to do something. And it's really, really hard to figure out or narrow down what that something is. And it was only once I started trying as many things as possible that I figured it out. Because if, when I was 15, you told me you're going to want to be a novelist. I'd be like, that doesn't sound right to me. It, but you don't know exactly who you are until you try. And it was once I tried that I was like, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. And that feeling was that clarity after years of having this ache, but not knowing you know, that there's itch and I don't know how to scratch it. And then having that clarity of this is it. Oh, it was, it was the best. It was the best yeah. feeling. It's so important. Um sort of giving ourselves space to change our minds as well I'm, I'm sort of having this conversation with my stepdaughter at the moment who's looking at which university she's going to go to and feeling the weight of that decision like this is going to determine the rest of my life and it really doesn't you know like so many of my friends who do really cool things that they love the degree they got has zero relevance like literally mm -hmm. none and I think sometimes mm -hmm. we feel really bound to well, this is what I do and this is what I have to do. But like you say, if you can, even in your, if you have time to do a hobby or something that just makes you feel good, exploring different areas to find out what really floats your boat is, is so important. And I guess also having the confidence to go, yeah, I'm good at this. This, you know, I think that this yeah. is worth pursuing because obviously you've naturally got a lot of drive. Is that something, you know, do you have to motivate yourself to write or do you feel like it's just a, being a creative state and in that flow is just a wonderful feeling that you're you don't have to motivate yourself to get in that mm, no I definitely have to motivate myself I think I function in two modes which is like overdrive or sloth and like that's <laughs> it like I only have these two modes and so getting the sloth to move into overdrive is is always a hard one um and then quite frankly getting pulling overdrive down and getting back into sloth is those transitions are tough for me I'm just really type a so um if I'm going to say that I'm going to do something I have to do it I have to get it done by a certain date I have to stick to my and I, I have to stick to my to-do list and if I don't well I haven't I haven't done enough today and I don't feel good that's not a great way to motivate yourself, which is to say, oh, if I don't do this certain amount of work today, I don't, I haven't like lived today enough. I I'm trying to get out of that. Yeah, I, I know that one. It's hard, isn't it? When you feel like you just haven't nailed the day, which is a very new concept. Like I doubt our grandparents mm -hmm. saw that. They were just like, oh, everything went okay today. Great. Thank my lucky stars. Yeah. But I think we've got all yeah, these survived expectations. survived another one. Yes, yeah, so another day. We're going, oh my God, I didn't manage to do this list of 10 fancy things I was meant to do to feel okay about myself. It's it's mm -hmm. it's a real tough one. And I guess also it's making me think, well, this is about me personally, but how much of my self-worth can get wrapped up in not only that, you know, how much I've done, but also the level at which I'm working. And how much of your self-worth do you think is wrapped up in the standard of your writing and you know this isn't like we've talked about earlier this is not then what the spectators are saying the commentators, right. commentators are saying but how much of your self-worth is wrapped up in yeah I wrote 10,000 words and they were all absolutely impeccable I can feel good about myself today way 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 too much yeah. I, I think that for me and it's less about even the quality of the work and more just productivity in general um, what do I have to show for today? At the end of the day, what did I make or or leave that wasn't there before? Um, I don't want to think of my life that way. And I have for 10 years at least. And so I'm trying to learn how to approach the day with a different question or objective. It's not you know, how much did I make today? How many words, whatever. And more like, did am I making my life easier for tomorrow? Or so I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to think of what the question is. No, I know because I, I, I don't know what it yet. I don't know what the other question is because I do exactly the same. I, 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 and I think some of it, and I wonder if this has got worse for you the more 
renowned and loved you've become that you feel like you've really got to show up each day because again I'm not going to say this is solely a female issue but I think a lot of the time you go oh my god do I deserve the respect that I mm-hmm. have or the 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 love that I have or for me do I deserve the the people that are imbibing the work that I'm doing you know I need to show up like a hundred percent every single day otherwise you know, this doesn't add up. How can I deserve this? Mm -hmm. I guess that's an imposter syndrome type scenario. But do you think it's got worse with the better you've done? Definitely, because there's more to earn. I, if, if I'm being given more, I must earn more. It's always about, um, did I earn it? My husband always jokes that I seem to think I need to earn the air that I breathe. And, (laughs) and it's true. I do. This is the way I behave. It's like, like okay, I, you know, I did all my chores and I did this and I, and I did this for this person. I did that for that person. And I did all these things that I didn't want to do for other people. So maybe I can just breathe for five minutes for me. That's how I earned it, which is so silly, right? Like, uh, but it's a mentality that I'm only at the very, very beginning of seeing in myself and don't have any answers yet for how I'm going to change it. I can just tell you that for a really long time, my productivity was very much tied to a fear of what it would mean if I wasn't productive. And I want to convert that productivity to joy, but do that in a way that doesn't mean that I lose my seriousness about it, if that makes sense. Because yeah, it's I do a hard it's balance. Seriously. It is. And it, and look, ultimately, this is my job, right? This is what yeah. I get paid to do. And I take it seriously as a job. So there are going to be times where I need to write and I don't feel like writing. How do I get myself to do that without it being a punishing piece of my brain that's like, Taylor, if you don't do this, you won't have earned your space for today. Yeah, You'll have nothing to show for it. You wasted your totally. time. And to also have days of if there is the opportunity, nothingness or just fun Mm -hmm. without having Mm -hmm. earned it. You know, I've really struggled with that one. I think a lot of people listening to this will go, oh God, yeah, I don't allow myself to have that much fun. And, you know, it's different for everybody that everyone's on a different, you know, sort of schedule, has a different work, life balance, Mm -hmm. et cetera. But I think we're all very reticent in this weird modern age we're in to let ourselves experience just idleness or fun. And I actually, Mm -hmm. this is really relevant to my life this week because I can be ridiculously uh, driven and disciplined and have that feeling of, well, I've got to work hard because I'm very lucky to have the platform that I have or to be even doing this work that I'm doing. I need to prove that I deserve this but then at the weekend and I have that fear of like not being productive and at the weekend me and my six best mates who I've known since I was five went to a restaurant casual dinner no no big plans we were going to have one drink I haven't been properly drunk in like five years this night took a serious turn for the the worst (laughs) slash best and we ended up like causing an absolute ruckus in this restaurant everyone was staring at us like I'm actually mortified about it like cause the real scene in the cab on the way home playing music really loudly like we're dancing all night felt the next day obviously felt horrendous well I haven't had a hangover Mm -hmm. for a long time felt Mm -hmm. horrendous did nothing apart from eat snacks like high salt snacks for a whole day I achieved Mm -hmm. nothing but it was the best best time Ever. And I was like, I need to do that more. Yeah. Well, and also do it without, and this is where I think we all struggle, do it without all of the caveats that you're supposed to feel guilty about, yeah. right? Because I, it doesn't sound like you hurt anybody when you were out. What? It doesn't sound like you did anything that was really even probably all that inconvenient to anybody else, right? Just a bit loud. And, yeah. And, and yet, you know, even when you say it, you're like, oh, we, you know, we caused such a ruckus, you know, we were, and it's like, you were just enjoying yourself, you know, (laughs) and it's okay to do that. It's okay to do that. But I think we really, um, we have learned somewhere along the way that joy is not a reason to do something. Yeah, I know. What the hell is that about? I honestly don't know. And I'm really trying to to cut it out because it is its own reason 
It isn't. It's a bloody good reason because life is short. And if we're not experiencing joy, what the fuck are we doing, quite frankly? But I yeah. sometimes feel scared that someone's going to go to me, oh, it's all right for you. You can have fun. You're allowed joy. I can't have joy. And I think, oh, God, do I not deserve? And I go into my little hole. Yes. Oh, God, yeah. maybe I don't deserve yeah. joy. And I get all scared. And I need to, I need to get over that. I've, I'm really seeing that here now, Taylor. Well, but I do it too. And we live yeah. in a society that has a really hard time with balance, right? Yeah. You can be joyful in this moment and then also really care about other people and other things. And, you know, it's it's about each individual moment. And what I'm really trying to do is understand that joy is not easy to come by. And when it shows up, let it in. You know, yeah. that's basically what I'm we trying to do. We all deserve it. That's we the broad do. message here. We yeah. all deserve joy fact yes and it and it will make our it will make us then stronger and allow us to live with more ease in the moments where joy is harder to come by yeah and actually it allows you to be more of service anyway because if you are joyful without you're spreading question. joy but like who was it producer anushka will tell me someone said recently on the podcast or maybe it was in a book and i referenced it what miserable people in the world don't need is more miserable people that is exactly Exactly right. But I think sometimes I think, well, there's so many miserable people in the world, so I shouldn't feel happy at all. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, I just, right. what I should do is try to be as happy as I can, because then I will have more space to give others what I may yes. be able to give. Yes. And also, personally, I don't want your next book to be miserable. Can it be just like, I... equally as joyful as the others? Because I don't want to read a miserable book. Okay. All right. You you heard it here first. Good. My next book will not be miserable. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, God, Taylor. I didn't expect us to go off on any of these tangents. You know, joy, fox shit, all of the things we've talked about today. It's it started been great and ended great. It really did. It really did. And I'm just so glad that we've had the chance to chat, even though though it's not face to face one day that will happen we'll make sure of it but again I I'll, I'll start as I finish it finished uh oh wait I'll finish as I started saying <laughs> just a massive thank you for all of these beautiful books that have just filled me with so much happiness and thank you so much for talking today oh thank you for having me and thank you for reading it really means a lot <laughs>